Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about how you type all 16 types in a way that is effective. And I'm going to mention about all the types in this video. And I'm going to talk about a way of typing that tends not to work really well, which is pretty common. First of all, I'm going to talk about the effective approach that tends to work well. In this approach, it's helpful to know that the cognitive functions tend to express themselves in real time. And by real time, I mean, if you are like watching someone in a video or you're interacting with them in person, there's things, there's signs that you could pick up on in real time that correspond with the cognitive functions. Obviously, the ones that the person is strongest at, but also what they're weakest at too, because with the weaker cognitive functions, you could completely feel the, the lack of those functions. When I'm talking about like looking at the cognitive functions express themselves in real time, yes, I'm talking about the content of their speech, but it's also more than their speech, it's also how someone carries themselves and their facial expressions. And this goes to visual identification, which a lot of people, they're like, yeah, I don't believe in visual identification. That's not like, that's a silly kind of thing. But it makes a lot of sense to me because if you're like expressing yourself in real time, what you're saying, and also it's more than what you're saying, it's also your cognitive activity. So even when you're not speaking, there's your cognitive activity that's running mentally, your facial expressions and your posture and how you carry yourself tends to correspond with that. And it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. Say that if you're in your head, like you're kind of like spacing out in your, in your head. And if you actually take up that posture, if you actually do that, like you know, space up to space out a bit, you can see like that shows up on my face, right? A bit of a more unfocused kind of look. And if I'm like very present, I'm looking at like what's around me, you see like my eyes become naturally wider and I um, look a lot more like present too. So that's basically how typing works. Types tend to express more one modality than the other. So they're going to do, be doing more of one thing than the other, but like in, in different kinds of ways. So it's not just the amount of presence, but it's also like um, there's other kind of forms that the cognitive functions express themselves. The best typing is done dynamically in this real time kind of way, the immediate presentation, I'm not saying you can suddenly figure out what someone's type is like an instant, but if you observe them like over time, but like you're looking at them and how they're presenting themselves, that is the best way to type. So what's a way of typing that tends not to work that well, it tends to be very inaccurate. And this is very common is that rather than this bottom up approach, I'm talking about where you're assessing based on real-time data and you're kind of like putting that together to kind of form a, an idea of what someone's type is, people have a very top-down approach. So what they do is that they assess the person's overall character or their overall ethics and their overall perspective in life. I'm not saying this, is, this does not work, but it's a very crude approach. And tends to lead to a lot of inaccurate typings. A lot of people do this. A lot of websites do this. And the problem is that it also, uh, besides being inaccurate, also leads to a prejudice as well. Because if you like that person's character or, or ethic, you think, oh, they must be this kind of type, right? Or they have this, this kind of overall disposition, overall perspective on life. And one that you favor, they must be this type. Is one that you don't favor, they tend to be that type. So it leads to prejudice. Now, I want to let you know before I move on that if you feel a lot of stress due to a lot of obligations in your life or goals to meet up with or standards to meet up with, I have a video about how you can lower that stress while still fulfilling those obligations, standards, and goals. And I also want to let you know that I've written an article about coming to peace with conflicting sides of yourself. You feel like yourself is being pulled in different directions by different parts of yourself. This video is about how you could look at this from a different perspective. So I have the video up above and also down below in the description box. 
and I have the article itself down below in the description box. So I'm going to first talk about ENFJs, ESFJs, ESFPs, and also ENFPs. So when we read about a description of these types, we pick up on someone who presents as happy or chipper or emotionally energetic or emotionally responsive or who's lively and enthusiastic. And the thing is, yes, they might present this way, but we might assume that is their inherent or deeper disposition. So we might read about like a happy person who's engaged and we think, well, this person must be one of these four types, but that's not necessarily the case. This is a poor way to type. That's the top down approach. These types are as likely as other types to feel depressed. So the thing is, we might read about someone who is depressed, like their life is a a life of depression. And we might assume, well, you know, this, this person can't be one of these four types, can't be like an ENFJ or ESFJ or ESFP and ENFP, right? Because I know them as like lively, enthusiastic people. So they can't, they can't, they can't be those types. They must be like an INFP or ISFP or something like that. So this is not a great way to type. These types, these four types are as likely as other types to be depressed. So what's going on here? So the thing is, these first two types, ENFJ and ESFJ, they are dominant extrude feeling types. And these last two types, ESFP and ENFP, though they don't value extrude feeling, according to socionics, extra feeling is actually a strong function of theirs. It's not one they value, but strong. And that's what creates this tendency in real time for these types to be more likely present as kind of, kind of appearing happier because they kind of like smile more, right? More chipper, more emotionally enthusiastic or responsive to others. And this is a very important point because these types are more likely than other types to be able to disguise symptoms of depression because Symptoms of depression include lack of desire and listlessness. And we think, well, that's not what I know about these these types, right? Uh, When I read a description of them. But these traits, depression is as likely in these types as other types, right? And they do, when they're depressed, these four types are going to have that lack of desire and they're going to have that listlessness and that withdrawalness, but they're going to disguise it well because in real time, they're going to present with the extra feeling. We want to type someone well You want to look at that more real-time presentation, but what's behind that real-time presentation, that is more based on the individual, whether that person's happy or not. That's much less dependent on type. There are some real-time things you can pick up on to see if someone's depressed. And that's often people um, who have uh, these kind of grief lines that kind of show up. That shows up regardless of type, even if they're like ENFJs, ESFPs, ESFJs, ENFPs. They're going to have those lines too when they're depressed. Other thing that we might assume is that these types are more inherently at that deeper level, at that characterological level, more likely to be empathetic than other types. So I have something to say about this. I believe it is true in a sense that you could say that in, when, in the real-time presentation, how they operate functionally, they are actually more likely to really be empathetic because they're going to be more receptive. They're going to be more welcoming. They're more attentive to what people need, reading what people want in real time. So they have that, that you know, they have empathy at that level, right? But at that deeper characterological level, like that deeper genuine empathy for others, they're not going to be more likely to have that compared to other types. I'm not saying they're less likely to have it. They're just um, not, not more likely to have it than other types. For that deeper level of empathy, I think all the types have equal access, including thinking types, but thinking types at that functional level, right? They're not going to necessarily display that kind of empathy, but at a deeper level, they very much can have it equally as a feeling type. The thing is, this leads to mistyping because we might read about someone who's virtuous or or very kind in their life and giving in their life and say, oh, this person is an extra feeling type, right? And people often make that kind of 
assumption, but this is the least accurate way to type them. The best way is to see how they're acting in real time. So now let's look at INTP, ISTP, INTJ, and also ISTJ. So a lot of the things I said about the previous four types is relevant here for these four types I'm talking about right now, except everything is flipped the other way. For these four types, if you look at INTP and also ISTP, they have very weak X-ray feeling due to it being an inferior function for them. And for INTJs and also ICJs, their very weak function is also X-ray feeling because it's their polar function. So you could have these individuals of these types who are very empathetic, especially at that deeper characterological level, right? That I was talking about before. However, because of the weakness in extra feeling at that functional level, at that real-time presentation, they may come off as less empathetic and as being more cold-blooded to the world, right? And the problem is like when we kind of extrapolate from that external presentation to say this is how they inherently are like, that they're cold-blooded. I don't think these types are any more likely to be more or less empathetic than the types I've mentioned before in an overall kind of sense. They just lack this immediate functional empathy as displayed and expressed through expert feelings. So a lot of these types, they test as feeling types. And you might know people of these types and you're like, well, I know them as being empathetic, right? The thing is, you're knowing them beyond that functional level. So you might think that they're not these types, but they are these types. Now, I do want to mention here that when you look at the extremes, so people who are like the very maladapted INTJs, for example, they might, you know, have like a stereotypically uh, like that stereotypical story of like, you know, the INTJ who wants to like take over the world and, and things that, of that nature. There might be those kind of tendencies, but for normal everyday readings of people, I think INTJs, a lot of them can be very, very empathetic. In fact, I want to tell you that I work as a psychotherapist and most psychotherapists are me are actually INTJs. And you could have someone who's an ENFJ, for example, where you can have an ENFJ who's very psychopathic. So they're lacking that empathy at that deeper level, but at a functional level, they have that empathy. So they could use that to mani manipulate others. So in the end, I don't believe one type is more empathetic than the other. When a type lacks extra feeling, especially the INTJs and the ISTJs, because they have it as a polar function, you immediately feel like there's something lacking, like there's a way that they're not engaging with others in an emotionally responsive way. And as a result, you might think, oh, this person does not like me. Or And the thing is, that's not true. And we might mistake that as that they don't care, they're not empathetic, but that, that's not true at all. It's kind of like what I've mentioned before about the previous four types where I might think that they're happy people when they may not necessarily be, and they might actually be depressed. So now let's talk about ENTJs, ESTJs, ESTPs, and also ENTPs. So when you look at these types, there's a big misconception that these types lack values, morals, and ethics. And that's because ENTJs and ESTJs, they're very, they're very weak at introverted feeling because that is their inferior function. And ENTJ, ENTPs and also ESTPs are very weak at introverted feeling because that's their polar function. So they lack that introverted feeling cognitive functions. It's very weak in them. So as a result, as I was saying before, what this causes is that there's a lack of introverted feeling presentation at that functional level. So when you're watching them in real time, these types are not going to present as like appropriate or sensitive or thoughtful or civil or delicate. Maybe with some training they do, but overall, especially the, the introverted feeling polar types, the ENTPs, the ECPs, they're going to come off as particularly like inappropriate or insensitive or appearing to lack thoughtfulness or not being civil or not delicate, right? But that does not mean that's not how they are at a deeper level. So at for these four types, 
they can be very genuinely thoughtful and considerate of others at that characterological level, but at that functional level, in that real time when they're interacting, engaging with others, they're going to be making mistakes in the feeling realm. So when they're making these mistakes, when they're acting this way, this inappropriate and in a sensitive way, this might accidentally be extrapolated as, well, they're acting this way, so they must be lacking values. They must be lacking ethics, right? Especially if you're like an interfeeling dominant type. So I'm an interfeeling dominant type. So from my perspective, it might kind of appear that way. But I know when I'm interacting with these types that these types, people of these types very much do care about morals, ethics, and values. And it may not seem so, particularly for ENTPs and ECPs, but when I talk with them, they a lot of them very much care about values and ethics. It really depends on the person they are. But it's not, that's not, the values and ethics is not determined by their type. In fact, with these four types, what I find is that when they have ethics and values and strong ethics and values, they tend to express it in a very adamant and outspoken way. And that's because of their cognitive setup. They're very weak at injured feeling and stronger expert thinking. And that strong expert thinking, that's how that tends to come across. ENTPs and ECPs, you might not think of them as expert thinking types, but they have it as a demonstrative function. So that means it's actually very strong in, in, in the background. So in the end, I don't think these types are, are less likely to have values, morals, or ethics than other types. But they might kind of seem that way because of how they act. But at that deeper level, no, I don't think there is a difference. Again, I want to mention at the extremes, like when you look at a, a very maladaptive form of the type, like what I mentioned with the INTJ, like you're going to, the maladaptive form of that type would be someone who's cold blooded and wanting to take over the world, right? You have like an ESTP who's not very healthy, they're, uh, then they're going to follow the stereotypical trajectory of causing all sorts of shenanigans to others. But when you're doing a general reading of the average population of these types, they often are going to very much have their ethics in value. So finally, I'm going to talk about INFPs, ISFPs, ISFJs, and INFJs. So the things I talked about regarding the last four types is really relevant here, except everything slipped the other way piece. These are the opposite type. INFPs, ISFPs, obviously very strong introverted feeling because that's the dominant function. ISFJs, INFJs actually also have very strong introverted feeling. It's a demonstrative function. It just happens not to be valued. In real time, how this presents, so when you're observing these types and an immediate kind of impression that you get, how they operate at a functional level is that these types present in, with a delicate manner, they're soft-spoken, they're sensitive, they're soulful, they're civilized. These types have a lot of immediate, like very nice and pleasant behaviors, right? But all types are equally capable of being nice. So yes, these types I'm talking about here, yes, they are really acting nice, right? They're having a lot of nice behaviors, but at the deeper like genuine characterological level, are they nice? That's not dependent on their type. And I've spoken to a lot of individuals who are INFPs, ISFPs, ISFJs, and INFJs. And if you get beyond that nice surface and you explore their deeper ideas, it's like, wow, your head is like in the gutter. Or they might have like an unpleasant take on the world and people or might be bigoted, even bigoted, prejudiced, and, and mean, right? So they're not more likely to be these things compared to other types. I'm saying it's not determined by type. So I like to think like this. So if these types become villains, if individuals within these types become villains, they would be stealth villains. On the other hand, what I would say is like, there's a lot of individuals within these types, they could be rather mischievous, uh, and I'm not saying that in like the way I was saying before, like bigoted and mean, right? Just just mischievous in, in a benign way, just like in a playful kind of way, but it's not apparent on the surface because of the, the functional operation of introverted feelings, because 
of that soft-spoken, sensitive nature. It's, it's not apparent. These individuals within the, this, these types could very much have those kind of thoughts. I, I could very much consider myself as having a bit of mischievous about myself, even though I don't necessarily present that way. So the next thing I want to talk about is melancholy and depression. So are these types melancholic? And I would say, yes, they are, or they're likely to present this way, not all individuals within these types, but the introverted feeling um, causes these four types to have a melancholic disposition. And that's because at a functional level, they're thinking wistful thoughts, or they might be kind of bluesy, right? So at that level, yes, very much so. But at a deeper level, are they actually depressed? And I would say that that is not dependent on type. And the final thing I want to say is that these types may be individuals within these types may be more determined than they appear. Because again, on the outside, these types appear rather soft because of that soft presentation. Uh, other people might think, oh, the, these people must not be determined or very active in their life. That may not be actually true. So for myself as an INFP, um, actually, I have like 10 projects going on at the same time, and I'm very determined to make them happen. But because I have like a soft-spoken nature on the outside, it kind of hides that. <laughs> on the other hand, I was to say, all these types have very weak expert thinking, INFPs, ISFPs, because that's the inferior function. And for ISFJs and INFJs, that's because it's the polar function, right? So at a functional level, yes, pretty inefficient. So we'll make mistakes with efficiency. So to summarize, what I'm saying here is that the best way to type someone is through the cognitive functions, especially as they express themselves in real time. The further you try to go deeper with someone to to assess their overall character, it's hard to determine their type from that standpoint. I'm not saying it can't be done. It could very much well be done, but the most concrete and specific data that directly points to what the person's type is, is on the surface level. The thing is, I have so many people come to me and say like, I am a feeling type because I am empathetic and that just doesn't work. And when I see them, I could tell they're, they're actually a thinking type. So the thing is, it's true you are empathetic and empathetic at a very deep level, right? And maybe more so than the average person. But the thing is, the real question is, do you make errors in the feeling function, like when you express it in real time? And a lot of thinking types, especially when they're younger, they, they could come off as insensitive that way. But that does not mean that you're not empathetic in an overall kind of sense. And the question that I have for feeling types is, yes, you may be a tough-minded person in an overall sense, but do you express more of introverted feeling and extroverted feeling behaviors at a functional level? If so, that makes you a feeling type. Thanks so much for watching. I don't know how to end these.